Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Welcome home, Brains. There's only one requirement to hang out on the edge, is that you open your big brain and close your small mind. Did you bring your thinking caps? It's time to put them on, because the conversation starts now. It's cold as a witch's tit. <laughs> Oops. Well, yesterday it, it did go. That's okay. That yeah, yes, it was. We were 21 degrees, which is like your 48 or whatever, and then it went right down to zero to freezing. We had to bring in all our plants from outside. The oh snow. my goodness! But oh, now today yeah. it's gorgeous out there. You know, I used to work in Canada. Oh, uh, where? That. that was my territory, honey. I, all the way from Toronto to Banff. Oh, uh, oh, but Banff I, is where I, yeah, I lived in Banff. That's really close to me, yeah. I stayed in the castle. Girl, I felt like a queen. And I saw the Japanese students there on break. Who <clears throat> could afford $4,000 a night almost. Yep, 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 yep. My company could. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Well, welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney. Just do your thing. Have your beverage. It's fine. (laughs) We are at the place where the conversation is pointed. The guests are sharp and the responses are never dull. We are here with Susan Jensen or Jansen. How do you pronounce it? Jansen? Jansen, yes. Jansen from Canada. I guess you guys heard that already, though. And you know what? She is happy for no reason. (laughs) We're going to talk to her about that and about happiness because I've got my own point of view and my own perspective when it comes to happiness. Uh, She's an excellent realtor and she's going to show us an amazing clip of a superstar. (laughs) Brain, tell me, welcome to the edge, Susan Jansen. Hi, babe. Hi, I, so nice to be here. Thank you so much. This is oh, great. Yes, I'm excited to have you. So tell us a little bit about your story. Where did it all begin? Wow, a long, long time ago. <laughs> I'm not telling you exactly when, but you know what? I come, you know, when people ask me about that, especially when they ask me, are you always happy? Because I really do feel like I'm a resilient and I know I've been through a lot of trauma in my, so I'll just give you a kind of a little snip snippet if that's okay so as a as a child I was actually born out of wedlock to a, a, a beautiful mom that just couldn't take care of me and um, I was placed in foster care I was abandoned and neglected and actually I was sexually abused in a foster care home the first one I was in and then when my mom when I got enough courage to tell my mom she actually came to take me up but the government put me back in a second one so I that was like my, my first five, six years of life. So it wasn't a place, you know how they say the first, you know, five years, you need security in your life, right? So I never did have that. But um, I can say though, that then I did live off and on with my mom, I actually lived in a convent with 100 other little girls when I was nine, 10 and 11. And uh, six overworked nuns, can you imagine having six nuns take care of 100 kids? <clears throat> but you know what, that is a place where I honestly believe that my resilience started and it, it took hold, the seed was there. I had, I used to go to the chapel every day and it was my, it was a, a safe place. And I'm sure a lot of people who are listening or who have had trauma in their life, like having a safe place is sacred. I mean, sometimes you just, sometimes people don't even have that. And I'm, so I, I was blessed to have that place where I felt this is for me and this is my safe place and God was my heavenly father I didn't have a real one but he was my heavenly one so that was my space <clears throat> so I lived there two and a half years and uh, then I moved out of there moved back with my mom till I w- went to junior high but as soon as I was 15 I left home because I thought I can do this on my own I don't need right. I don't need anybody <laughs> I've been through so much already so but I you know what I realized that even after that, I got married to a guitar player. We went on the road for 10 years, mm. laid in lounges every night for six nights a week in the days when there was music everywhere. Wow. And um, recorded an album. And then I had two little babies. And then I actually got divorced after 10 years of marriage. And my babies were one and two. Wow. So now I'm on my own again. But again, I still felt like I can do this. Like we right. were the three musketeers. We can do this. 
So even, and then, but as long as I was singing and I was on stage, I was, people were actually listening to me. I actually was the first time in my life that I ever thought that, you know, when I would start singing a song, people would stop drinking or stop, and they'd be looking at the stage as like, whoa, like they're really listening to me. This is, so for me, that was my, you know, my joy and my happiness during those years of singing. And then even after that, I was um, considered like I was chosen, actually, I sang 15 years professionally. And then they came and as told us at Edmonton, Alberta, if you're aware of this area, we have a Klondike Days was like the like the Calgary Stampede in Calgary. We were the Klondike Days in Edmonton. It was a big deal. And they actually came to me one time I was singing and a bunch of us uh, girls were singing in a bridal fair. And they said, you know, you girls can audition, but you'll never win the Klondike Kate position. And then so actually what happened was that I thought I've been doing this for years. I'll audition. And if I don't win, it's that's fine. But anyway, I won it. So I was Klondike Kate for two full years in Edmonton, Alberta. And I've sang with Barbara Titola. I went to Vegas at, and sang at the Desert Inn. I did so many cool, cool Lynn Anderson. I met, uh, I met so many amazing people. But again, now that I'm in this position today where I took this happy for no reason certification and I'm a trainer, now I'm getting it that those were all external. Everything that brought me happiness during all that time. Right. Yes, I was resilient. And yes, I, was, I felt like I was happy. But I now know that it was all external circumstances. And if those the external, if they didn't applaud or if they didn't like me singing or some guy was too loud and not paying attention, then I would kind of plumb it because I didn't get But what does that, how did that really, what was your aha moment? Okay. Oh, now, my oh, aha oh. moment. So you got excited about, you know, the crowd. Cause I do that when I, you know, I'm out in front of an audience and I do spoken word poetry and the audience resonates with me. You know, we're in the hand claps and finger snaps. It does something to me because you're pouring into these people. So what is, uh, what does it do for you? What is it? How does it make you feel? Do you have a sense of power, a sense of control? Mm -hmm. Are you in that loving space? What does it do for you when you're in front of an audience? Well, during those times, like not today, it's different, but during all that time, cause I sang for 20 years professionally. So those were the times where I felt validated. I felt appreciated. I felt the love that I was not getting from my inside. Mm. I felt um, like I really honestly felt like these are my best friends. They love me. And whenever, when I would sing, I'd send out announcements and they'd all show up every, each and every time. But when I went through my divorce, did I get a phone call from any of these people? Right. <laughs> when, when, I, when I was going through a really, really hard time, so I, my, uh, well, they, during, again, then I really appreciated them and I loved it and I loved all of that, but I didn't understand why do I still feel really kind of lonely and why do I feel alone here? Right. And I'm on my own still. And so I still had that feeling, except for God, it was the only one that I felt was on my side, but everything else. So I, it was up and down for me. So when I played, it was amazing. I go home and I'd be like, you know. I know, it's just kind of in that place. But you know, it's good that you uh, found happiness because a lot of times people find drugs and alcohol. Right. You know, and they, that's called they, happy for a bad reason. We it, have no, it. Yeah, and they're not happy. You know, happiness to me is a drug, though, in all honesty. Uh, people are always chasing that happiness high. What's going to be the next thing that makes me happy? Is it going to be a new car? Is it going to be a new man? Is it going to be a new dress? Is it going to be a ticket to a concert? What is it that is going to make me happy? People are not able to find contentment. And I think that that is uh, being content and being at peace. Because if you don't, you will never understand the ebbs and flows. You won't understand what makes you happy, what makes you sad. And sometimes in my darkest hour, you know, I find happiness in there because that's a learning space. That's a time to sit back, be quiet, and pay attention to that small inner voice that's trying to, to get out. So what did you learn in this course in Happy for No Reason? Right. Well, what you were just talking about is called the myth of more. 
there's the myth of more that we all believe in and it's not true and that's so in my course that's one of the things we tackle saying okay well, i'll be happy when i lose pound 10 pounds or i'm going to be happy when i go on holidays or when when i get married or i'll be happier when i have a different job you know like all of those things those are really wanting something different and not being happy where you are in that moment so what i learned is that and the definition in, in the course material that I present is happiness means it's an inner state of peace and well-being. And it's a constant state. So it doesn't matter when bad things happen or say if I was singing and I went home, I'd still have that up. You know, I didn't I wouldn't crash and burn like I used to. So it's having an inner sense of peace and well-being that is constant. We call it a happiness set point. So that's one of the how things you, that I train. How do you find that though? I mean, is that through meditation? Is it through talk therapy? Is yeah. it through a good cup of tea and a good book? <laughs> how do you find that place? Right. Well, the happiness set point, everyone has a happiness set point currently, right? It doesn't matter where you are. So if you, if you, um, and for a really good example is if when people win the lottery, so they've won $20 million or whatever they win. And like they're on this high here. But you know what always happens is they always revert with might take a year, year and a half or so. And they go right back to where they were before. So that happiness set point we know is 50% genetic. You know, the cap half full, cup half empty thing mm -hmm. that everyone has. But we also know that it's 10% your circumstances. It's only 10% your circumstances. Mm -hmm. So people say, well... You know, I was in a bad car accident and now I, I got a limp or something like they'll use that to not be happy because they'll use right. that excuse. But you know what? The other 40 percent is our habits and the things that we believe our beliefs about ourselves. Right. So if you take the 50 percent genetic and the 40 percent habits and the things that we can physically do and change and learn and grow every day, we got 90 percent control here over our happiness so we can raise the happiness set point and then to answer your question there's so many cool ways like we in our course we have there's it's here this is like a little book it's got 21 ways to raise your happiness set point oh, wow. and this is this is everything from um meditations my inner heart technique it's called heart math inner ease techniques it's beautiful and then it's also practices we've got a game that you will love um if well it's where you it's called a blame shame and complain game and what you do I is for people that could master that i know i know i know so true and so if you just go for one week because that's one one like i do seven weeks so then i kind of present little ideas and practices that you go home and practice for the week and come back and let's talk about it but anyway it's so you have like a, a big jar a dish in your kitchen and you we have toonies and loonies here in Canada but you guys have your dollars <laughs> right so what happens is every time and to to um, identify so when you complain about anything it's because you're mad about somebody else is doing something right like upset you right so you're complaining right. and, and oh the or the weather's bad or you shouldn't have parked there or you uh you're this lineup's too long or whatever it is you complain or if you shame and that means where you're actually beating yourself up for something like oh i'm so stupid and why did i do that and it's it's on yourself when you right. shame mm -hmm. or uh blame shame and complain what blame on oh, blame is when you blame everybody else for what's happening to you you know, it's your fault, your, your husband's fault that you're sad or it's everyone's right, fault, right. but yours. So those are the three blame, shame and complaint. So every time you find yourself doing one in that week, you put in a dollar in the bowl, mm. like every time. I mean, sometimes like for me, the first time I did this, I put in thirty two dollars in the bowl wow. because I wasn't aware. And I was like, right. Oh my gosh, I did it again. And then the kids are saying, Hey, mom, put that in there. You know, like they'll remind me. But you know what? After the second week when I did it, I put in like $15. And then the third week, it was like two. Mm. Because now I'm so aware of being in the moment, right. not blaming, shaming, or complaining about what else is going on or that is influencing me. My happiness set point's going to stay. It doesn't matter when all those influence. Well, that's that's a great technique. That's just something that you can, you know, that you can try right now, brains. Okay, get your exactly. little jar. It's like a swear jar, you know, when you when you curse or anything. It's a constant reminder. It's pushing that button. 
What do you say to the angry person? You know, oh, the, the shame, blame, or complain is one thing. We got people that are straight up angry. Yeah. And you know what? So many times people have reason. I mean, there are reasons to be angry. And we know, like we know and the that we've got only two emotions, right? Anger and uh, fear and love. And normally when somebody is really super angry about anything, and then there are so many examples we could give, right? But when they're angry about anything, usually it's a fear of something. Mm. So it, again, just like that blame, shame, and complain game, you actually have to sit back and go, like, why am I so upset at the guy that I'm honking at in the traffic when he didn't do anything to me other than maybe he's annoying? But like, it, there's got to be another reason and that anger is coming out, right? So it's really sitting back and analyzing, saying, what am I afraid of? Like, what is going on with me? So this whole happy for no reason is really an opportunity to really become aware of when you do things that are negative, because you really don't want to do things specifically blame, shame, and complain, or, or those kind of things that are negative, right? And But when you do have anger about something, you really have to sit back and figure it out. What is it? You know? Okay, so how does a person reach this point? You know, because they have these anger management courses that people go through all the time. And it mm -hmm. seems like they come out even angrier <laughs> after they've been therapized. So what do you do when you look in the mirror and you say, you know what, I'm tired of this. I'm yeah. tired of feeling this way. I'm tired of not having any friends. I'm tired of suck sucking all the oxygen out of the room when I go in there because people don't want to be around you. And I've, no. I've got some people uh, that are in my life, but they're, you know, over there only because I, I'm a happy person. I'm a mellow person. Uh, I like to listen to you, but I'm only going to listen to your problems twice. Yeah. And if you are not working towards a solution towards that, I'm not the girl to call. Because again, you're sucking the oxygen out of the room. You're, you're Debbie Downer or, you know, a Joe Schmo. I can't do that. Yeah. So twofold. One, what do you say to the person that's at that point that really wants to try to break out? And two, what do you say to the people that support them? Because, mm. you know, it's, it's a three-legged stool. And, and someone's coming in your house and they're, you know, your husband, your wife, your kid, whatever, and they're always unhappy. What do you say to those two type of people? Mm, wow, you got it. There's a lot there, but let me unpack that a little bit. And the first thing that came to me when you said looking in the mirror, when you're just unhappy about something, that's one of actually the techniques. Because one of the main things about being happy for no reason is having a love for yourself, a love affair with yourself. Mm. And a lot of people hate themselves. And that's where that blame, shame, and complain comes in. That's when they're just negative about everything. Everyone else is making them feel badly. But you know what? We are 100% responsible for our own happiness. Yes. Nobody else. I agree. Nobody else. And so one of the techniques that we use is look is the mirror thing where you actually you say to yourself, I love you. I understand you. You're having a rough day, but you're okay. You know, yeah. like, I love what you're doing. I love that you're trying to be better. I love uh, everything about you. And what happens is that your happiness set point goes up. And then you, you have to do that. This is not like an instant thing. And I totally understand that. And it does take an understanding. But, um, and I was just thinking about something else that you, that you mentioned. We call it the garden. Like we've got seven, uh, seven steps to being happy for no reason. And there's four pillars that we talk about the pillar of the mind. So how are you, what are you thinking? And what, you know, we talk about um, serotonin or uh, would, the pillar of the body, actually, we talk about the serotonin, melanin, mel mela, I just went out of my brain, oh. melatonin. And uh, we talk about the pillar of the, the heart, like how compassionate are you? Right. How loving are you to yourself, especially? Because once you are compassionate and loving to yourself, it spills out. Absolutely. And what happens is that you start now attracting, not idiots anymore, you're now you're attracting loving people. Mm. And then the last one is the pillar of the soul. And that's where you have um, a connection to something that's greater than you, like whatever, whoever you call that. I call it God. There's your divine power, the universe, whatever you call it. It's very personal, but you need a connection to something greater than yourself. 
Hi. And then, and then we also call what you talked about is the, the toxic people in your life, the negative people in your life. We call that the garden. And so what, how's your garden growing here? Like how are you surrounding yourself with roses and daffodils and beautiful flowers? Or are you surrounding yourself with those toxic people who just drain you, who suck By a you bunch know, of dandelions and weeds? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so what we say, okay, if, but what happens too is if you're negative, and if you're imposing or, or blaming or shaming them, you're just attracting the same. Now you're just, right. it just keeps going. So yeah. what happens is you need to be centered in yourself, be your loving self. And then you can lovingly say to those people, you know what? I understand that you're hurting, but I don't need to hear that right now. You know, like you need to deal with that, you know, yes. and I'm sorry, I can't help you. And if you want help, I'm here to help you. But you know, I, I'm, you've said, you've complained about that same thing for 20 years now. And I'm, I'm, I'm done now listening to that. But if you want to talk about anything else, I love you. I'm here for you. Right. you know? Yeah, you have to shut it down. You have to teach people how to treat you, Susan. I mean, that's just what happens. But you know how to get love and receive love. And you're going to share a very special clip on your why with us. Tell me a little bit. I've got this cute little video for you. What do you, you want, Claire? Mm -hmm. What CD? Mama. You want grandma CD? Grandma CD please. Okay, you're done listening to your music? Grandma CD CD. You want grandma CD? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Okay, let's see grandma CD. Grandma CD. Okay, let's see. Ready? Ready? Yeah. beautiful granddaughter and I do want to share with you just a little uh, story about her and why she's so precious to me and why she's my why um, why I'm doing what I'm doing um, she's currently today she's eight years old in grade two but actually she's grade three but when she was eight weeks old she had near SIDS her mom had put her to bed uh, at 9 30 at night and then went and checked on her and she was actually in the crib but she was blue and uh, thank god she was revived and she went to the hospital and was at our Stollery Children's Center for five weeks. Um, but she, they called it near SIDS. So a lot of you I know have experienced that. We met a lot of moms there. But Kalea had um, brain damage. And because of that, she had cerebral palsy. She currently has cerebral palsy. And she also has cortical vision impairment. But during the whole five weeks she was at the Stollery, I had that CD and that song. Well, the whole, my whole CD, but she remembers the words. And I used to put that under her pillow when she slept. And I just remember her. Obviously, as she got older, she remembered that. So that for me, just hearing her sing, hearing her happiness, seeing her joy, uh, just always brings joy to my heart. So that's kind of where I'm coming from in my Happy for No Reason course. And what I want to, that's where I want to be. And what I want to help others get there too. So I can tell you that I do have a, an offer for you. And what I have in coming up is um, eight weeks of one hour a week. And it's the whole gamut of your inner home for happiness. And it's really taking a deep dive into finding out what makes you happy. And there are different areas, your mind, your body, your spirit, and your soul. And we talk about the garden, people you surround yourself with. We talk about your passion. And we just get really, we have a lot of fun. And we just get really deep dive into that just so that we can find out where you fit and how this works for you. So again, my uh, website is howtobehappier.ca. I'm from Canada, so it's .ca, howtobehappier.ca. And I have a free offer there for a 30 minute phone consultation. And I send you a happy for no reason uh, questionnaire so we can find out where you wanna start and where you're at. 
So I'm very happy to have you join me on this next course. I'm going to be doing them, you know, after this as well, of course. But at least that'll give you the information where to go and how to click and how to just contact me. I would just love to meet you and to spend some time with you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. I appreciate you and value. Uh, Come back to the edge. It's always a pleasure. Okay? Thank you so much.